Okay, well, this evening we are continuing in the Olivet Discourse. Um, I'm not intending to go all the way to the end, the two chapters, but I do want to spend one more week on it after this week. Uh, what we're looking at now is what Jesus says is going to happen immediately following the tribulation of those days. And I, I want you to note the word immediately. Um, we're, we are in Matthew's gospel, and I know that Mark uses that word quite a bit, and immediately doesn't always mean that it's happening like right away, but Mark is showing us just the active nature of um, Jesus' ministry, but in Matthew's gospel, the word immediately is not used as frequently, and so I think we should assume that what Jesus is referring to here is what is going to happen immediately following on that, well, that time of, of great difficulty, which we saw, is one of the worst, actually the worst thing that ever has or ever will happen to any people in history. So let's, let's read the passage. Uh, first of all, Matthew 24, verses 29 through 31. But immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. And then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. And then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now again, of all the um, sections that we have seen in the Olivet Discourse, this is probably the one that for most people would imply that it's referring to the second coming. Now imagery like this is used in the second coming, but we need to see it's, it's because similar things are taking place. Christ is coming, he's coming in judgment and so forth, and so similar language is used. But let's, let's begin again by considering the context. Remember, when we're looking at the Olivet Discourse and we're trying to determine what it is that Jesus was talking about, as in every other passage of Scripture, we need to examine the context, and that's what we have been doing. Now, try to take this in. This is just trying to summarize the things that we have seen very briefly, not all of them, but the ones having to do with context, because that is so very important here. This discussion that Jesus has with his disciples on the Mount of Olives follows on the eight curses, first of all, that Jesus pronounced against the Jews, against the Jewish leaders. It follows on his declaration that they would be charged with the guilt of all the righteous blood shed on earth that their house would be destroyed and that this judgment would fall on the people who were then living, who were alive at that time. Jesus says at the end of Matthew 23, after those events that I've just referred to, in verse 36, truly I say to you, all these things will come upon this generation. So there was a a, uh, a tremendous, a great judgment that was coming upon Israel because of what they were going to do to Christ. Okay, that's what Matthew 23 was about. That discussion took place in the temple. They left the temple. And then, as you know, the disciples began to point out the buildings to Christ. And he said it was all going to be torn down. And then the Olivet Discourse, remember, is Jesus' answer to the questions the disciples asked after he said that, when is that temple, which was then standing, going to be destroyed? What would be the signs that he was about to come in judgment against Jerusalem and that the Jewish age had come or was coming to an end? Now, when answering these questions, Noted, we noted that Jesus applies what he was saying to them specifically. See to it that no one misleads you, in verse 4. You will be hearing of wars and rumors of wars, verse 6. 
Verse 9, then they will deliver you to tribulation and will kill you, and you will be hated by all nations because of my name. And then when he finished answering the questions, we haven't gotten to this, this text yet, but we will next week. He again emphasizes that everything he had just said is going to take place in their lifetime. Because again, this is the judgment Jesus spoke about in Matthew 23. The destruction of Jerusalem and of the temple, that, that was what Jesus was talking about in Matthew 24. But he says, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. So the Olivet Discourse is all about God's judgment on the Jews for their rejection of his son. Everything that God had given them, everything he had done for them was to prepare them for the coming of the Messiah. When Messiah comes, they reject him and they crucify him. And this is God's response to that, charging them with this crime. Now, having seen the signs that this judgment was near, remember false messiahs, wars, rumors of wars, famines, disease, earthquakes, persecution, betrayal, lawlessness, weakening of natural affections, and that the gospel would be preached to the whole world, and the whole world, that phrase, meant to the Jew, the Roman Empire, and we saw that all that happened within this time frame, all of these things were taking place, and the entire world, the entire Roman Empire was evangelized. We saw last week the sign that this judgment had come was the abomination of desolation, spoken of by Daniel the prophet. The armies of Rome marching against Jerusalem would mark the beginning of the desolation of the city and the temple. When they saw this, they were immediately to run or they would be trapped within the city and have to suffer the greatest tribulation that anyone would ever have to face. God was sending his ministers of justice in order to end the corruption of his covenant people. Okay, wherever the rotting corpse is, wherever the body is, there the vultures or the eagles shall be gathered. Now tonight Jesus tells us what would happen following that tribulation. There's going to be four things. Okay? Uh, there would be changes in the heavens. I, I'm just giving you what appears on the surface. We'll look at what this imagery means. The sign of the Son of Man would appear. The tribes of the earth would mourn. And he would send his angels to gather his elect. Now let's begin with the changes in the heavens. This is what R.C. was referring to, remember last year, by what he called astronomical perturbations. <laughs> okay, changes in the heavens. All right. We read in verse 29, Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall from the sky and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Now, as I've said, this kind of imagery seems to imply the second coming, all of this throughout this passage. But we, again, need to understand similar language is used because something similar is happening here. When Jesus comes in the second coming, he's coming to, to save his church, but he's coming in judgment on the wicked and the same thing is happening here. Jesus is warning his church to, to get out because he is coming in judgment. So we shouldn't be surprised similar language is being used in both instances. Now, first, um, he appears to be coming in uh, the way, let's see, in, well, okay, uh, let me think about this for a second. I'm not sure that's a correct statement. Okay. We do know that when Jesus returns, there, there is going to be, again, this, this idea of this darkening and so forth coming. I think what I was thinking of here was we also see this image of Jesus coming in the clouds. And uh, that kind of follows on what we've already seen, that imagery here is used similar to the second coming. Remember when Jesus ascended into heaven? 
and the disciples were looking up into heaven and watching him as a cloud received him and took him out of their sight. And while they're standing there staring, two angels appeared and they said, why are you staring? Why are you looking up into heaven? This one who has gone into heaven will return in the same way in which he has, you know, has, has ascended. So he will come back on a cloud. So again, this imagery seems to connote this second coming, but this is what I want to say here. We need to remember the context. The context, so very important, brings us back to what Jesus is really speaking about here. Verse 34 and verse 36 of the previous chapter, truly I say to you, this generation will not pass away until all these things take place. We looked earlier at the fact that generation is always referring not to a people, not to a race of people, but it refers to the people living at the time, okay? So they would not pass away until these things take place. Whatever he was referring to, Jesus, must have taken place at or around 70 AD, the length of one generation from the time in which he spoke these words. Now consider also the word immediately. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, okay, the, and the tribulation was connected with the abomination of desolation that they were supposed to run away from, uh, these things would happen. The, the, the sun, moon, and the stars would, would be darkened, first of all. We need to understand that Jesus is still referring to his judgment on Jerusalem in 70 AD. So what does he mean by these changes in the heavens? Well, here's, here's really an opportunity for us to, to, to see one of the things, one of the, uh, how would you put it, it's, it's perhaps an interpretive principle, and that is that very often New Testament writers draw upon Old Testament images in order to, to make a point. We see that in the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, there are many references to Old Testament images, okay? And we see that also in the New Testament. Now, in this case, that is what Jesus is doing. He is drawing on Old Testament imagery to get his point across because his audience would be familiar with it. So the question is, what does this imagery actually refer to? Well, it refers to, in the Old Testament, God's judgment on a nation, particularly the overthrowing of a political power. Now, let me give you two examples. Remember that I told you, I asked you at the beginning from Isaiah 13, verse 10, is this referring to the second coming? Because that same imagery is used here. Well, no, it isn't, okay? What it's referring to is God's judgment on Babylon, okay? Let me read to you a, a few um, verses from Isaiah 13. Um, first of all, in verse 1, the oracle concerning Babylon, which Isaiah the son of Amos saw, and then skipping forward to verse 9, behold the day of the Lord. Now, I, I should just pause for a moment here, because there are those who believe the day of the Lord, that phrase can only refer to one thing, and that is our Lord's coming in judgment. It starts with the rapture. I mean, in broad evangelicalism, it starts with the rapture. It goes through seven years of tribulation. It refers also to the second coming, and it lapses another thousand years through the millennium and refers to the final judgment. The day of the Lord, uh, well, first of all, I should say, all those events that I just referred to, we believe, happen at one time, okay? But the day of the Lord does not always refer to the second coming, okay? The day of the Lord refers to any time God brings judgment. So he says this, behold, the day of the Lord is coming, cruel with fury and burning anger to make the land a desolation and he will exterminate its sinners from it. Now, he's referring to Babylon. For the stars of heaven and their constellations will not flash forth their light. The sun will be dark when it rises, and the moon will not shed its light. 
Thus, I will punish the world. By the way, just as the world in, um, you know, how Jesus said in the Olivet Discourse we saw earlier, the gospel we preached in the whole world before the end comes. It was referring to the Roman Empire. Here, the world at that time was Babylon. It was a world empire. So he says here that he will punish the world. And what he means is the Babylonian Empire for its evil and the wicked for their iniquity. I will also put an end to the arrogance of the proud and abase the haughtiness of the ruthless. I will make mortal man scarcer than pure gold and mankind than the gold of Ophir. Therefore, I will make the heavens tremble and the earth will be shaken from its place at the fury of the Lord of hosts in the day of his burning anger. Now, that is the language the Lord used to speak about a future judgment on Babylon and God did judge Babylon, okay? I wasn't referring to the second coming, but notice again, there were signs in the heavens, okay? The darkening of the sun and the moon and the constellations and so forth. Now, um, the second example comes from Ezekiel 32 verses two through eight, where the Lord is pronouncing judgment against Egypt. And again, listen to the imagery that's used here. Ezekiel 32, two through eight. Son of man, take up a lamentation over Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and say to him, you compared yourself to a young lion of the nations, yet you were like the monster in the seas, and you burst forth in the rivers and muddied the waters with your feet and fouled their rivers. Thus says the Lord God, now I will spread my net over you with a company of many peoples, and they shall lift you up in my net. I will leave you on the land. I will cast you on the open field, and I will cause all the birds of the heavens to dwell on you, and I will satisfy the beasts of the whole earth with you. I will lay your flesh on the mountains and fill the valley with your refuse. I will also make the land drink the discharge of your blood as far as the mountains and the ravines will be full of you. And when I extinguish you, I will cover the heavens and darken their stars. I will cover the sun with a cloud and the moon will not give its light. All the shining lights in the heavens I will darken over you and will set darkness on your land, declares the Lord God. Now again, in both examples, God's judgment against these nations was characterized by the darkening of the sun the moon and the stars. Now, we might ask the question, was this literal darkness or was it symbolic or figurative? I, I think it's more likely figurative and it could mean one of two things, okay? We do know that God made the sun, the moon and the stars, placed them in the skies over, you know, over the earth to give us, show us the times and the seasons and directions, they are a blessing that God has given to us. In judgment, he takes them away, takes away the light and he brings darkness. So it could be just symbolic of his removal of blessing, or it could just simply be referring uh, to judgment on the nation itself, because the sun, moon, and stars could be referring to a particular nation. Let me give you one example. In Genesis 37, verse 9, where Joseph had his dream, remember? He said, now he, he had still another dream and related it to his brothers and said, Lo, I have had still another dream, and behold, the sun and the moon and eleven stars were bowing down to me. Now, in this case, it's referring to, um, well, uh, Jacob and uh, well, I guess it would be his, his mother and his brothers, okay? But they're representative of the nation of Israel. The same imagery is used in the book of Revelation where it talks about the woman who's clothed with the moon and the stars and, and, and the sun, and she gives birth to the child, and the dragon is waiting to devour it and, and so forth, and then the woman flees into the wilderness. Uh, it's referring to the nation of Israel. So this imagery can be used to refer to nations and the darkening of these lights of this particular nation could simply be referring to judgment on that nation. 
So what is the point here? Well, the darkening of the stars means that God is bringing judgment upon Israel, and he is overthrowing them. Okay, as he did Babylon, as he did Egypt, he's bringing judgment on them. That's why the darkness, okay? Now, next, Jesus tells us in verse 30, the sign of the Son of Man will appear in the sky. Now, remember what Jesus said earlier in the Olivet Discourse? He already warned his disciples to beware of those who would rise up claiming to be the Christ. And he distinguished his coming from theirs in that his would be clearly seen. Uh, in Luke 20, 17, verse 24, he says this, for just like the lightning when it flashes out of one part of the sky, shines to the other part of the sky, so will the Son of Man be in his day. Jesus said something similar in the Olivet Discourse, and I, that was a parallel passage to the Olivet Discourse. Even as it flashes out of the east, even to the west, so shall the coming of the Son of Man be. Now, that coming, as we have been looking at, would be a coming in judgment. And what Jesus is saying here is this, that when this judgment, when he will have brought this judgment upon the Jews, it would be clear to them that he has come and that he is the Messiah, okay? That the sign of the Son of Man is the fact that he has come in judgment against them just as he said he would. Now, let me read for you uh, one comment of John Lightfoot, who was a Hebrew scholar. He was somebody who was a, an expert on Jewish tradition, uh, on the Talmud, and so forth. He, he lived during the time of the English Puritans. His commentaries are so scholarly, they're still used today. Now, that, that's, you know, that, that says something about the man, but this is what he says. In his commentary on the Gospels, on this particular verse, then shall the Son of Man give a proof of himself whom they would not before acknowledge. As proof indeed, not in any visible figure, he's not coming bodily, but in vengeance and judgment so visible that all the tribes of the earth shall be forced to acknowledge him, the avenger. The Jews would not know him. Now they shall know him, whether they will or not. Many times they asked of him a sign. Now a sign shall appear that he is the true Messiah whom they despised, derided, and crucified, namely his signal vengeance and fury such as never any nation felt from the first foundations of the world. So the idea that Jesus portrays himself as coming on the clouds, okay, They'll see the sign of the Son of Man. Coming in the clouds is really an Old Testament symbol, again, drawing upon Old Testament imagery of his coming in judgment, okay? When the Lord came against the nation, he very often described himself as riding on the clouds of heaven. You know, he used the cloud as his chariot, or he surrounded himself with clouds and darkness, as we've already seen. Now, after David experienced the Lord's deliverance from Saul, he wrote this in Psalm 18, verses 10 through 14. He, that is the Lord, rode upon a cherub and flew, and he sped upon the wings of the wind. He made darkness his hiding place, his canopy around him, darkness of waters, thick clouds of the skies. From the brightness before him past his thick clouds, hailstones and coals of fire. The Lord also thundered in the heavens, and the Most High uttered his voice, hailstones and coals of fire. He sent out his arrows and scattered them, and lightning flashes in abundance and routed them. Now, one thing to note is this is the way David describes the Lord's deliverance of him from Saul. But God did not literally come down on a cloud in order to help David, nor did he send out arrows and things of that nature. This is figurative language to describe the Lord's judgment and deliverance. Clouds are figurative of divine majesty, and they often symbolize a stormy destruction. 
Now, Isaiah also writes regarding God's judgment on Egypt in Isaiah 19, verse 1. The oracle concerning Egypt. Behold, the Lord is riding on a swift cloud and is about to come to Egypt. The idols of Egypt will tremble at his presence and the heart of the Egyptians will melt within them. Now, again, did when the Lord judged Egypt, did he come bodily, as it were, on a cloud as he, uh, as he judged Egypt? No, but this symbolism refers to his coming in judgment against Egypt, okay? Now, this is what Jesus meant when he was talking about the sign of the Son of Man appearing in the heavens and that Jesus would come in a cloud, okay? Remember what he said to the high priest when he was on trial, after the high priest pressed him whether or not he was the Christ. He said this in Matthew 26, 63, and 64. You have said it yourself. Nevertheless, I tell you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of power and coming on the clouds of heaven. Jesus told the high priest he would see whatever it is that coming in the clouds was all about. The high priest would live to see it. And by the way, when he says you, he's not talking about just the high priest. It's the plural form. He was addressing the whole assembly. Remember how Jesus said, this generation will not pass away until all these things are accomplished. He's telling that generation you will see these things. Now, when he comes, again, this would be a time of grief and not a time of joy for the Jews. We see in verse 30, when they see the sign of the Son of Man coming in, in, the, in the clouds, then all the tribes of the earth will mourn and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of the sky with power and great glory. Now, what is Jesus talking about here? Well, tribes, okay? What are the tribes? That word is used most frequently in the New Testament to refer to the, the Jewish tribes. And the word here, world, can also be translated land. The tribes of the land will see this. And it can also refer to the, again, the, the Roman Empire where the Jews are dispersed. And what Jesus meant is simply this, that that generation of Jews would live to see this coming and this judgment, and it would be a time of mourning for them because the judgment is directed against them. By the way, think about what um, uh, John writes in Revelation 1, verse 7. Behold, he is coming with the clouds, and every eye will see him, even those who pierced him, and all the tribes of the earth will mourn over him. So it is to be. That's one of the reasons why um, those who see the Olivet Discourse taking place in 70 AD also believe the book of Revelation is referring to the same time frame because it contains that same kind of language. Those who pierced him will see him. That generation, all the tribes of the earth, that is, the Jews will mourn over him. Now, finally, and this perhaps is, again, one of the more difficult parts to understand here, Jesus says in verse 31, He will send forth His angels with a great trumpet, and they will gather together His elect from the four winds, from one end of the sky to the other. Now, again, at first glance, it appears as though Jesus is, is talking about the rapture of the church, doesn't it? Uh, it sounds very similar to what Paul says in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and so we shall always be with the Lord. Okay, well, very, very similar. But again, okay, he can't be referring to his second coming in our passage, though he is referring to it in 1 Thessalonians, because he says, for one thing, 
All these things are going to take place before that generation passed away. Secondly, immediately after the tribulation of those days, then this is going to take place. He will send forth his angels with a great trumpet and so forth. So what is it that Jesus is referring to? If he's not referring to sending the angels to gather together all of his people in the rapture. Well, I think that most likely he's referring to the evangelization of the furthest reaches of the world. Okay, let's not forget the whole world may have been evangelized, but that was just the Roman Empire. There were still people in other places, right? The four corners of the earth, that's, more, that's a more expansive term than that phrase that is used for the Roman Empire. This trumpet imagery that is used in, in the second coming and used here has to do with gathering, okay? Gathering people together. When Jesus returns with the trumpet, he is gathering his people together. When he sends his angels out to gather the elect with the trumpet, it has to do with gathering these people together. Now, this is, again, Old Testament imagery. This is how the tribes of Israel were called together into a holy assembly through the blowing of the trumpet. Leviticus 23, verse 24, you should know this because you've just read the book of Leviticus, remember? Speak to the sons of Israel, saying, In the seventh month, on the first of the month, you shall have a rest, a reminder by blowing of trumpets, a holy convocation. And those trumpets were blown to gather God's people together. Remember, they, they were in the wilderness. They were all encamped in one great encampment, but they were being gathered together to worship the Lord. Well, what do we make of these angels? Okay. How is it that Jesus says he's sending the angels to do this? Well, remember that angel, the word that's translated here, angel, does not always refer to angelic beings. It's also used for, for human messengers, okay? Uh, for instance, we read in Luke 7, verse 24, when the messengers of John had left, he began to speak to the crowds about John. What did you go out into the wilderness to see? A reed shaken by the wind. Now, that word that's translated there, messengers, when the messengers of John had left, is the same word, angelos, which is translated angels. So if, if we use that word to refer to angelic beings, in every instance, we'd have to say, when the angels of John had left, then Jesus began to speak to the crowds. But we know that's not what happened, because John sent a couple of his disciples to ask Jesus whether he was the expected one, or whether they should look for someone else. And that's what they did. They came to him. And when they left, they were the messengers of John. Okay, so this is the way Lightfoot explains what Jesus means here. When Jerusalem shall be reduced to ashes, and that wicked nation cut off and rejected, then shall the Son of Man send his ministers with the trumpet of the gospel, and they shall gather his elect of the several nations from the four corners of heaven, so that God shall not want a church. He shall not lack a church. Although that ancient people of his be rejected and cast off, but that ancient Jewish church being destroyed, remember Jesus said, the end of the age, the end of the Jewish age, a new church shall be called out of the Gentiles. So the idea is that after God brings judgment upon the Jews, after Jesus tears down the typological kingdom of God, okay, Jerusalem and the temple, he sent his disciples out to gather his elect people from all the nations into a spiritual kingdom that was no longer going to be exclusively Jewish, but now included the Gentiles, okay? So all, what, I'm, what I'm trying to show us here is this. The context tells us that what Jesus is referring to is 70 AD. We see Jesus was bringing judgment against them and what that judgment was for. And he also says all these things were going to happen within that generation. What I'm suggesting to you from what we've looked at this evening is that this imagery, though it is similar to the second coming, doesn't have to refer to the second coming. All it really 
means is that he is coming in judgment against Jerusalem for their rejection of his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. So judgment in both cases, similar language that is being used to describe it. Okay. So next week what we're going to do is just look, we're going to conclude, I think, but look at some of Jesus' concluding warnings based upon what he's just said. And we're going to want to see that time frame reference again because we haven't actually gotten to it yet. But the warnings that Jesus gives based upon everything that he has said up to this point, he directs to his disciples. Again, because they were going to live to see this happen. Jesus expected it to take place before they died. Well, let's, um, let's stop there and um, let's just bow for a moment of prayer. And let's again just thank the Lord that he is true to his word. Um, what he says is going to happen, will in fact happen. Let's not forget too, when he threatens judgment, that judgment's going to take place as well. But when he also promises deliverance, that deliverance will take place if we trust the Lord Jesus.